This is Vern Benham Grimsley on campus. You were saying that you began to become aware, almost subliminally perhaps, of a need for religion, a questing after God or reality. How would you describe that? Well, I got uh, into uh, LSD and uh, STP and grass pretty heavily and uh, stay st stayed stoned for about, I would say, about four or five months, just high uh, constantly. When I started to come down, I'd pop more or smoke more and go up again. And uh, it was a valuable experience to me personally uh, because it did drive me inward as the psychologists or police or whoever uh, say. Uh, it had the effect of making me see who and what I was. I mean this entire extended period of taking drugs? Uh, well, I guess it just brought me down to uh, a low level uh, so that uh, when I uh, went a day or two without the drugs, I saw, you know, my God, you know, good grief, what in the world? Uh, not only the drugs, but some of the thoughts I had had and uh, of uh, who am I, what am I, uh, what is the, uh, the sense of uh, ambition or uh, looking to the future. Uh, I felt like a complete, you know, miserable wretch, a complete slob. This became a very depressing thing for you then? Uh, very depressing, and I started thinking quite a bit about, uh, I guess, the time-honored phrase, meaning of life, or at least uh, some glimmer of hope on the way uh, to finding out uh, some meaning or partial meaning. Uh, in my life or just life generally, capital L or what have you. One comedian's line to a young man, young man, someday you're going to find yourself and when you do you'll be very disappointed. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, horrified when I <laughs> saw what I was and realized uh, exactly uh, who I am, just uh, uh, what I have inside of me and uh, it was quite frightening. What about this craving of God or after religion? Uh, well, I couldn't find, all I could find uh, for answers, you're a wretch, you're this, you're that, you're a son of a gun, and so forth and so on, uh, learn to accept it. Everybody has his own trip. And uh, I found that I just, just very simply had to uh, accept the fact of God, the fact to me, the personal fact of God, that, uh, that God does exist, that there is a creator, or, uh, Something, somebody, uh, an unknown, an X, uh, whatever, uh, that just, I can't explain, uh, not only in words, but I can't even figure out in my own, own mind that I have not the slightest idea of what God is or what God does. Just now you were referring to God symbolically as the unknown or the X. This unknown can become the known, that a person can come into such a close, contiguous harmony with this God that he can come to know God, he can have a sense of vital fellowship and companionship with God, that this in itself is able to transform life. If you believe, for example, that you're a child of God, that you are not somehow a cosmic orphan stranded down here on this planet Earth, but that there's a meaning to life, then this transforms the entire outlook, the entire perspective a person has, almost as if he went from down in a valley up onto a mountain top and was able to see a new panorama, a new meaning. Daring to believe that a person is loved by God, that the universe is not just benignly indifferent, but friendly, really, in the highest sense, as an act of faith, makes things different. This is one of the things that uh, has been of most comfort to me. All of my friends uh, look at girls as uh, a plaything in bed, had other friends as uh, a guy to uh, take up five minutes when we need uh, company over a sandwich or uh, borrow a car uh, and uh, much more subtle uh, things. Uh, a roommate for a semester and so forth and so on. In other words, simply using people instead of entering into meaningful relationships with them and seeing them as brothers. For example, when you go into one of these corner lunch counters around 11.30 or so and the entire counter is not completely filled up, you never sit down. It's almost as if it's an unwritten rule. You never sit down right next to somebody. You always leave at least one stool at that counter. And then finally you get alternate stools all filled up and then somebody comes in and he of course has to break the chain. He has to be the first one to sit down next to somebody and he picks the most socially acceptable person at that lunch counter to sit down next to. If one has the perspective that this planet is a family, that we're brothers because we have one father, that there's a spiritual oneness uniting us, that, in fact, we all are indwelt by something divine, that God himself has given of himself, that we're not, as I say, disconnected cosmic orphans, but rather that we can have a tremendously vital and joyous, abundant sense of what life is about.
as children of God and seeking a higher will than our own. Because it is because people have refused to use their rational minds and instead have uh, used their emotional parts of their mind, which they always label spiritual, that uh, the world is in such a mess. I now, think it's precisely because they have not used this spirituality. It's because we have not drawn upon this infinite they do, potential, they call it which is love, which can manifest itself in goodness and truth and beauty, which can manifest itself in harmony on this earth and people living together as a brotherhood, children of God. That, I think, is the reason we have not had the kind of peace. Can you imagine? Let me ask you. Can you imagine if every person on this... <laughs> can you imagine if every person on this planet thought of himself as a son of God and a brother to man? Yeah, I can, I can imagine it. We'd all be dead in about three hours. If we thought of each other as members in one family, we'd all be dead? I can't believe that. Why would you say that? It's very simple, because in order to have that thought, we would all have to be insane, and insane people don't last very long. I think it's the ultimate sanity to think that you have great value. For instance, to say you're a son of God is to say that you are a creature of value, that you're loved, that you're cared about by God. you are a creature, that you are inferior to something which has absolute control over you, to say that you are below something. Point number one, he does not have absolute control. He does not have absolute control. I think God has given man freedom to make choices to follow him or not. To say that you are a child is to say that you are inferior. And as soon as everybody believes they're inferior, they start acting that way. Inferior to what? <laughs> inferior to what? If God... that, that there is some other being who is superior to us and that we can never hope to become anywhere near as great as that. That is the best ah, way But to Jesus said, be you perfect father. as your Father in heaven is perfect. So he said that man can attain to God. Uh -huh. That's the whole point, that man does not remain in one, his yeah, present... What? I see. I've, I've never heard or met of anyone yet who wound up being perfect, including Jesus. All right. What would you say was the trouble with Jesus' life? What would you think was the glaring imperfection of his life? Uh, mostly the fact that, A, he blew the resurrection bit by not knowing the soldiers were going to stab him, and B, because he had a habit of losing his temper. Yes, constantly. You know, ranting and raving at uh, the scribes and Pharisees, you know, and calling them hypocrites and all sorts of terrible names. Ben, and accurate journalism. Running, running in and hitting them with whips and kicking them out of the temple. I mean, he had a very, very strong-willed uh, anger. And Let me make one was, remark. That was a sign of perfection. In the Gospels of Mark well, and John, it, it where that people. incident of the cleansing of the temple occurs, in both places it says that Jesus drove the cattle out, used that as a cattle whip, but no place does it say he whipped any human being. Now that's simply a matter of record, you can read it yourself, and I think it's it quite an, an erroneous an concept that he was, was still an act of anger. violent was against still people. It was still an act of anger, and it was also an act of theft. So what about righteous indignation? Is there? How do we know it was anger? Does the Bible actually say that he was angry in doing this? No, it doesn't say that at all. I mean, a person, words, if, if a person... If I do it, it's anger. If I do it, it's righteous indignation. That's a good cop-out. I'll have to remember that. I think it's possible that Jesus could have done this in righteous indignation because, after all, his motivation, as he described it, was that this is my father's house, this is a spiritual place, you have turned it into a thieves' kitchen, as one of the translations, the J.B. Phillips translation, puts it. And to see something which is intended to be a place of spiritual communion, the very sort you were talking about, where a man could find God, could discover God, seeing it turned into a marketplace for symbolic ritualistic slaughter and so forth, was repugnant to Jesus. Well, was there's a, theft, what, I wanted, what I was asking was, uh, does the Bible describe an external behavior of Jesus or tell what his emotional state was? It only describes the behavior and it does not describe his emotional state. Well, isn't it possible that we attribute to a particular action the emotions we would have under those same actions, we can't, we can't condemn without anger. That is in, you know, in other words, we don't know Jesus' motive, and I think that's right. Yeah, exactly right. We cannot look at the actions of someone without saying that they had the emotions we would have while doing the actions, which means you've just thrown the entire Christian religion down the drain. No, which means that Jesus may not have been angry when he did that. <laughs> that he had good motivations for it. But you just told me that there's no way of knowing what his motivations were. He may have been a political demagogue, he may have been a revolutionary, he, he may have been someone who thought he was the Messiah. But you just said, just looking at his actions, you can't tell what his emotions were. And you've just thrown the entire religion down the drain. But, oh, because you have, those good, you, have the, you have the actions of Jesus to measure, and if those actions measure up to what you want to call good, then that's enough. I don't really care okay, about the inner motivations, which I can't know. I can't know those motivations. Jesus said one time, a good tree cannot bear evil fruit. You don't pick apples oh, from a fig tree. You don't pluck grapes and raspberries off a ragweed. Good. Now, I would say now, that therefore, if you, 
Look at a person's life, the fruit that he bears, the way he lives his life. You gain some impression, at least over a period of time, of what's motivating him. And if that person's motivated by love, he tends to manifest this in loving behavior toward fellow human beings, as Jesus did, and as we can. If you're in a, in a world that is doing so many injustices to minority groups, to, you know, to wherever it is, and you just sit there loving people, where, where do you... What are you doing? I had you're a black friend to say to me the other day that there is no such thing as an innocent bystander because if you're standing by and you see your brother being hurt, there's no such thing as somehow being aloof and above this and being innocent, he's still your brother. And this is, of course, the very point that Jesus made so beautifully in his parable of the Good Samaritan about a man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho who was beaten up, and then it was the religious people, and this is a telling point in Jesus' parable. It was the priest and the Levite who went by on the other side and who did not help this man. And finally, it was a Samaritan who happened to be a member of a group eschewed and hated by the Jews who ministered to this man. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. It's not just a matter of sitting by and thinking good thoughts toward other people, but it is a matter, finally, of getting down and helping another person because he's a brother. The idea of being loved by God is transformative, and it, too, is an experience which is spiritual, which is known inwardly, not just intellectually, not merely cognitively, but it's experienced that man can have this feeling of being in a friendly universe. You've been listening to On Campus, a non-sectarian, non-denominational public affairs presentation. For free printed transcripts, write to Box 347, Berkeley, California, 94701, and ask for the booklet Questions University Students Ask. It deals with such issues as science versus religion. How might a person define God? And to what extent is religion relevant in a scientific technological age? The title of that free booklet, once again, Questions University Students Ask. The mailing address, Box 347, Berkeley, California, 94701. I've also written Finding God, Getting to Know God, and Growing Spiritually. About the processes of inward discovery, the new power and purposeful resource inherent in living by faith. And another free piece of literature is Freedom from Fear. The mailing address box 347, Berkeley, California. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international network of stations, let me spell out that mailing address once again. Box 347, Berkeley, B-E-R-K-E-L-E-Y, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 94701, USA. When you write, please send us the call letters of the radio station over which you heard this international broadcast. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley, reminding you to tune in again next time over this same station for On Campus. And may God's will be done by you. Good day.